here. Um, okay. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, um, as, as some may know, you know, I live in California. So this is, uh, um, but I'm an early bird. So I, I'm used to working with people who live in the Eastern time zone. So um, this is fine. If, if we could just take a second, it would really help me. Um, one of the things I don't like about, you know, when I was in the parish, um, I could, you know, look, get in the pulpit and look out over the congregation and I could see, okay, who's here? Oh yeah, Joni's here today. And oh yeah, Bob's, well, where is, where is Bob? That's the, he sits over there. So if you could just quickly tell me your name and your your job title or you know wh what your position is, that would be really uh, helpful. And um, 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 we'll we'll just since I don't see names for everybody, just kind of jump in and say. And when we're done, we're done. And I, I notice we have a group over here uh, under D. E. Wilson. So we can, you can do those quickly. Okay, go. Who's gonna be first? Hello, I'm Denise Wilson. I'm a spiritual care intern here at the Ottawa Hospital. I'm urgently from New Brunswick and I'm very happy to be able to assist to your presentation today, Mr. George and Zozo. Great, great, thank you. I'm Bob Albert, I'm a spiritual care intern as well. Um, right. Originally. Okay. My Next. name is uh, Vijita. I'm uh, joining from Ottawa. I'm a spiritual care practitioner at the uh, Ottawa Hospital. Great. And you're going to have to unmute when you do this, folks. Bruce. Uh, and somebody, Gary. My name is Anne uh, McDonald. I'm a spiritual care practitioner at the Ottawa Hospital, the civic campus of the Ottawa Hospital. Thank you. Gary, uh, spiritual care at Pembroke Hospital. Okay. Um, I'm Bruce. I can't seem to get back on the camera on the uh, not sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. So I'm Bruce. I'm at um, on call uh, chaplain at CHEO, the Children's Hospital in Ottawa. Great. Who else? Tim? Adriana? Hi, I'm Tim. I'm a spiritual health practitioner in Kingston at Kingston General Hospital. Great. Hi, I'm Adriana, a Bruyere Continuing Care. I work as a clinical chaplain. Great. Okay. Well, um, anybody else that wants to jump in at some point, I, uh, I, I said before I was going to um, um, talk for a little bit. Can you all hear me? All right. Anybody? who can't, um, you could put stuff in the chat. Um, no camera or mic, okay, Julie, thank you very much. Um, and um, I'm not seeing my picture on here, so I'm hoping you all can see me. Robert, am I, you know, visible? Yes, here? I can I can see you okay. and I can hear you. Great, okay. So anyway, I'm George Hanzo. As you said, I'm, I've been a, Board certified chaplain with the Association of Professional Chaplains for since around 1980, something like that. Um, but uh, uh, I started a department um, at uh, Memorial Soul Center and Cancer Center. I was the founding director. Uh, they had they had chaplains there then, but there wasn't anything. Uh, we had a little office um, behind the. Uh, Literally behind the secretary's desk in the volunteer department on the on the sub in the sub basement of the hospital, so that gives you a good picture of the status of chaplaincy at that point in that place. It's it's an absolute wonderful picture. Um, 
we got we uh, wound up with eight chaplains uh, a number of years later, an office uh, right next to the main elevator is 10 steps off the lobby, uh, main lobby of the hospital. So over, over time, we worked that up. And I want to talk a little bit about that uh, and, and how that happened. Um, but I've also been in my history, I've been the chair of certification for the APC. Um, I was president of the Association of Professional Chaplains. I uh, chaired the effort that um, that wrote uh, what are now called uh, uh, common standards that um, uh, CASC used to use, but has, has abandoned now, uh, which is great, fine actually uh, with me. Um, and I uh, have now sit on several national committees in the US uh, and we founded a few years ago, uh, another organization called the Spiritual Care Association um, to and I can talk a little bit about why we did that, but it's not really germane to this talk, except that it's about leadership and it's about saying, you know, when is it time when you are in an organization and you're trying to bring change and you get to a point where you, you decide that um, change is just not gonna happen uh, in that context and it's time to move on and um, make changes in another place if that's what you're uh, interested in. So. That's the short genesis of the Spiritual Care Association. But I started uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, I was hired to be the pediatric chaplain. They had never had a pediatric person before. I was trained in pediatrics. I have a master's in developmental psych. Uh, and um, so I went in and um, was making my own way in this very complex, major academic, world-class medical center. So what to do? Um, I wasn't, um, I didn't have a position other than being um, a pediatric chaplain. And I think um, it, I've learned a, a, a good number of lessons across the, across the years. Um, in what to do and what not to do. So I, I wanna say a few things about that and then um, spend a good bit of time in, in your questions and discussion and bring yourself to this because I think a lot of, a lot of this is, um, a lot of leadership style has to do with who you are. There's not a right leadership style um, that, you know, do this, do it this way, that's right. Uh, it has to be um, consistent with your personality, with how you do things. I mean, some people are, um, I'm an introvert, I'm a raving introvert. Um, so I don't come on strong. There are extroverts that, uh, you know, come into a room and, hey, how are you? And, um, all of that, I, that's not my style. It wouldn't be comfortable for me. I, I, if I tried to do it, I would look like I was, which is like I was faking something. So you have to, you have to use your personality and there's not a, a personality type. I don't think that is inconsistent with being a leader. Um, don't, I don't think, say to yourself, uh, I can't be a leader because I just don't have the personality for it. I think that's just wrong. Uh, I think you can be a leader in your own way if you want to. Um, and if you have a passion for it and you have a passion for um, ideas and mission that, um, that work. And just like a good organization, you have to have uh, a sense of who you are and what you want done. And so for me, that mission has always been landing especially landing in a highly scientific institution where something that wasn't science and and chaplaincy was not science we didn't regard ourselves that way then and still often don't now um, we didn't speak the language of science and um so we were you know i mean we were marginalized as i just described and the, the mission of Memorial Sloan Kettering is to cure cancer. And in many ways, um, certainly then, 
not as much now, patients were a necessary evil to get you to the cure cancer. Uh, my mission always has been, and the thing I keep in front of me is, this is about patients. And this is what Robert, I were just talking about before in terms of politics, if some of you listened in. Um, it's not about my association growing. It's not about me growing. It's about best care for patients. And you can't do, in my view, best care for patients who are sick and suffering and trauma without caring for their spirit. And that's what we do. And that's the vision that we bring. And if we, if we don't bring it, if we don't get to the table and raise our hand and do it, it's not going to get done. It's as simple as that. You can say, well, there are nurses who really care, but there are, and thank goodness for them. Uh, but they are not the professionals that we are. They're not trained like we are. And they are ultimately, at the end of the day, going to look out for stuff that's nursing and not spiritual care is not front of mind to them all the time as it should be to us. And we have to understand that we are the people in the space that if we don't raise our hand and say, hey, what about this guy's, you know, this patient's values and their culture and their faith practice? No one will, probably. No one will. So that, that kind of, I think, mission is the first thing. Do you, do you have that fire to, to do that uh, and to want to do that uh, and to be willing to, you know, ultimately, like me, sit at a table with other people and um, make sure that that piece, you know, if you, get, if you do, then it's just a question of developing the style and the, um, the knowledge that allows you to do that. Um, so there was, a, there was a study, I don't know, some of you may have even seen it. There was part of this data was collected in Canada, uh, done by Austin Snowden and a team from Europe uh, and Ben and Hook, uh, Austin Snowden's from Scotland, uh, where they surveyed chaplains about their response during COVID. And they found out that one of the things, they, the major thing they found out was that chaplains who were clear about their mission, were clear about what they were there for, could articulate it clearly and succinctly. I emphasize succinctly because we chaplains are not good at being succinct. Then those people got us, had a space at the table already before COVID. And they tended to be valued, included, and in many cases, their departments grew during the pandemic. And they actually had people added a lot of the time. The, the chaplains who said that they really weren't clear about what their role was in the institution um, were the people who got furloughed, um, you know, positions eliminated, so on. There was a, dr a pretty dramatic correlation along those lines. So it's part of it is knowing what you have to offer and what you know, we know about and we care about um, people's spiritual being. Uh, and we have something to add and we know what that is. And um, I think we were just talking before about um, you know, in Canada, uh, what is that? I mean, that's up for debate now. You know, how much of that is psychological or psychotherapeutic practice? It's a, it's a real, it's a real jarring thing for people in the U.S. Chapels in the U.S. to hear Canadians talking about, you know, psychotherapies or, you know, psychotherapeutic interventions. Um, it's not something uh, a U.S. chaplain would would say. Uh, I think. Um, and it wouldn't go over well in the U.S. because it was like, well, we have those people. They're called mental health practitioners. We don't need you to do that. So what do you do? What do you do uniquely? And if you can get to that point, then there's a lot you don't know. Um, and that's okay. Um, when you come to a new place, there's a culture, there's people. There's any of you who have been in a place for a while know that there are 
unwritten rules that nobody tells you uh, that you you know either have to learn by chance or stumble into potholes and hopefully survive um, and the the thing to you know about that is that's okay I mean it's not okay but you know knowing that then enables you to uh, maneuver in the institution in a way and people don't expect you to know it um, one of the things I tell people um, is it's okay not to know a lot of things, to confess what you don't know, as long as you, there's something you do know that's clear. And to get to a table, and I would say um, one of the things for me is I think we, as chaplains and many people, are much too timid about asking for help. You know, we're taught to be in seminary, a lot of us, I was, to be a solo practitioner. Um, and that served me well in a, in a small inner city congregation where I was by myself. It doesn't serve well in a, in a complex um, interrelated healthcare institution. Um, you need to be um, linked with people who, uh, for whom you have values. And so networking is mandatory. Building relationships, risking calling people and saying, you know, can we talk? You know, you, I need some guidance on this, that, or the other thing. Uh, and uh, taking that risk, and some of them will ignore you or they won't really give you much time. Uh, and, um, but many, many, you will be shocked if you do this, I think. You will find a lot of people who will want to help you. Uh, and, you know, some of them may be big time uh, uh, people. I mean, I, I um, a colleague who I, I know, uh, they had a program in his place where you got to pick a mentor, uh, you know, from other people in the institution to uh, be a kind of a, a guide for you. And he decided he was going to ask the CEO of the hospital, and he did. And the CEO said yes, uh, and was was glad to do it. It was very helpful. It wouldn't have occurred to me, frankly, um, but I thought, boy, well, that was brilliant. And gutsy, I thought. Um, and it was hugely beneficial to him because he got to build a personal relationship with the CEO. He learned a lot about how the hospital worked, about who, you know, who was where and doing what. Um, but he he took a risk. I mean, he could have picked some head nurse who he was really familiar with and you know done very well, but he didn't do that. Um, but if you're going to do that, you then need to be respectful of those people and their time. Uh, you need to know what you want. You need to um, go with an agenda. You need to deal with the agenda and then get out of their office. Um, they are willing to mentor you, but not to be your bosom buddy for the most part. And that's important to know. Uh, it's not time to schmooze and socialize as we chaplains like to do and build relationship. It's a time to um, get the wisdom that they have from being in the institution. Um, this may be a clinician who you were, who really interacted with. Um, the other thing I think is, you know, so, so getting mentors, asking for help uh, is showing up. Um, I um, I would go to Memorial was an academic institution, but even in I trained at, at Yale you know, New Haven Hospital, Yale University Hospital in in New Haven, uh, in my first units of CPE, and um, you know I would go to rounds, I would go to walking rounds. I didn't understand the language most of the time, and. Usually after rounds, I had made notes of about 10 terms. It was like learning a new language. And I went to the 
physician's desk reference, the PDR, which was in the lounge and would look up all these terms and uh, learn the language. Um, and I think uh, all of that was, um, it, did, it did two things. One, I learned the issues that were important. And then I started to ask questions uh, about, well, you know, I saw this patient and, um, I, you know, it, it seemed to me important to know that, and that they um, are, um, you know, very devoted to their religious practice and they really think that God's gonna guide them uh, or something really important to the team. Like, you know, they, I think they think that there's gonna be a miracle here and this, they're sure this, this patient's gonna be cured and we know the patient's not gonna be cured. So we have a problem or I wouldn't say that, but I would just present the fact and stand back. And sometimes that would be ignored to the detriment of the team. Um, and sometimes they would go, oh goodness, okay, what do we do about that? Um, and then I would volunteer to talk to the family or why don't the doctor come and we'll talk to the family together. But I have to take some risks. And sometimes those risks uh, pan out and sometimes they don't. And sometimes you say the right thing and sometimes you say the wrong thing. Uh, and um, you learn from that and you make notes and you try not to say that again. Uh, or you ask somebody after the meeting, what did I say that was wrong? You know, I said something wrong. Um, well, you, you know, you inadvertently insulted Dr. Jones, who this was his big thing and you were questioning, oh, okay, good, okay. Should I go see Dr. Jones? Yeah, that might be a good idea. Or no, 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 don't do that. Um, and then I might go to see Dr. Jones and say, Dr. Jones, I really apologize. Um, I, I didn't really understand that. And, and can you help me a little understand what it is that is important to you um, about this? Uh, and then we talk. Uh, I think this is this whole thing is just like what we do with patients. I tell people, this is assessment and learning. It's about the same thing. It's about being curious. It's about listening. It's about asking questions. It's about showing up. And if you if you just practice that basic skill that we've all learned as chaplains how to do, we do it great with patients. If we could do it with other staff too. Um, and you know, it's it's a question of also doing that all over the hospital. Uh, and uh, um, you know, taking taking the time to go into the corners and ask people who can tell you. Uh, one of the things that I do now is some consulting with hospitals who are looking to upgrade their chaplaincy. Well, that's one of the services we offer at the healthcare chaplaincy. And um, story, um, we were in a in a institution, and we generally interview you know nurses, doctors, all kinds of people, trying to. And toward the end of the day, I think we had an empty spot, and we we um, asked the asked to be um, to have the director of the page operators in the hospital join us. And uh, one of the issues that had surfaced was that they were the hospital was having real trouble uh, connecting with the on call chaplain. Something wasn't working, it wasn't going through, something that nobody quite knew what, what the problem was, except it was kind of chronic. And it was a problem because nurses were kind of stopped calling the chaplain on call. And um, this woman comes in a room and sits down and I said, you know, do you have any idea why, the, why they're having trouble reaching the on-call chaplain? And she went into a rant. I've been telling them this for years. No one listens to me. No one, can, no one, I, my people know this. We don't know. And she knew the answer. She absolutely knew the answer. No one had ever asked. We go, okay, we could have spent a lot of time by talking to her first. Uh, we would have known the answer to that problem. Um, so it's, it's a question of, um, 
assessing and being there. And then the last thing I want to say is um, don't say no unless you absolutely positively have to. Even if it's something, many things that I said yes to, I had no clue how I was going to do them when I said yes. But I figured it out. You know, I went and I got help and I looked and I researched and I Googled and I did all that stuff. And I figured out um, what was what was going on uh, and um, did it. I mean, oh, early, very early story. Um, one of the people who took me under their wing at Memorial, who was wonderful, uh, was a, a woman named Jimmy Holland, um, now deceased. But Jimmy was considered, uh, was, you know, from a small town, was a psychiatrist, was a, from a, her, her parents were sharecroppers uh, in a, on a farm in Texas uh, outside of uh, uh, Dallas. Um, she went to medic, she was one of the few women in her medical school class at, at, uh, at Baylor um, and um, had six children. Um, married to a famous oncology husband, but she was, she's considered the mother of psycho-oncology, both nationally and internationally. And within a year or so when I was there, she had a big conference and she said, I want to, I want you to speak about chaplaincy, what chaplaincy is about. I thought, oh. But I did, I said yes. And I remember to this day, um, getting off the, off the stage, off the podium and coming down and Jimmy saying to me, huh, you really do have a theory for what you do. And I'm thinking, lady, you put me up there not knowing whether I had anything decent to say? My goodness, um, what a risk. Um, but she did. Uh, and, I, and I thought it through and I figured it out. I could have said no. Probably would have been the last time she would have asked me to, to talk at one of her conferences. Um, <clears throat> as a result of that, I got on um, the National Consensus Conference, uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network uh, Distress Management Panel, which I'm still on 15 years later, um, because I could speak for chaplains and had figured it out. Um, so the message in the elevator speech is everything. And um, I, I am, I've not said anything about leadership courses. I'm aware of that. I'm not a big fan of leadership courses. I'm not opposed if you wanna take one. Uh, there are several good ones around. Um, I've taken courses, a couple of things in kind of learning about myself, you know, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses kind of thing. And there are books about that that are helpful. Uh, I think that that's been helpful to me in places. Um, I, I, you know, I've said, people say, well, you need a chaplain's need to learn budgeting. I'm thinking, why? I ran a department for 20 years and the budget was, you know, add 3% to this, you know, this one is frozen. How, how, it's not higher mathematics any place, you know, we don't have that much of a budget ever in chaplaincy. Um, so uh, why we have to learn budgeting, I don't know. So it's that kind of thing. Um, the hardest thing I think in me in, in um, probably moving into leadership in a department was I was now um, boss of my, what had been, what have those who had been my peers. Uh, and they still, they had the same training I did. They did the same job I did, but I was now their manager and I was, um, I was, uh, responsible. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that was tough to learn. And, uh, cause I like being liked like everybody else. Uh, but that was, that was hard. Um. And the other thing I'm, so that you have to, you have to think about whether you really want to do that or not. And if you don't, there's still plenty of ways to lead in chaplaincy without being uh, managing other chaplains. And the other thing is, you know, the more you stick your head up out of the foxhole, um, somebody's going to shoot at you eventually. 
and um, you can't take that personally. Well, you can, but it's not a good idea. Um, to, and I, I still have to suck it up every once in a while when somebody doesn't want to be involved in something, my project, for purely political reasons that have nothing to do with the, the uh, part of the project. So, um, but that's, that's tough. If you're going to lead, there are others who are going to want to knock you down um, just because you're the leader and they're not. Um, I said I was president of the APC and members would get up and say, what are you all on the board doing? We, we like you on the board, we in the membership. Well, you know, I pay dues just like you do. I mean, I couldn't say that, but that was the truth. I pay dues just like you do, dude. Um, and, you know, I'm volunteering my time. I'm not getting paid for this. So, but you can't, you can't. Or if you do, it's really, it's gonna, you're really gonna, you're gonna pay for it. Um, so you, again, you have to be a little thick skinned from time to time. And again, if you're not ready for that, then there are other ways. You can do research, you can write. There's plenty of ways to publish. There's plenty of ways to lead without holding, you know, a public position. Uh, and um, and we need leaders um, in our profession badly, badly, badly. People who are willing to represent us uh, nationally and internationally. People who are willing to be part of hospital uh, structures and lift the banner for spiritual care. So with that, I'm going to stop. I wanted to stop a few minutes ago, but and and hope you have questions or comments or share your own experience or ask the questions out of your pl a place. And I'd be glad to we can we can discuss a little bit. Jump in, please. Remember to unmute. Thank you very much, George. I have a number of questions myself. I just want to open the floor to allow others to ask questions. We'll take a you know extra moment to allow people to unmute and ask their questions. Jump in, please, if you have comments or questions okay. for George Hanso. Or if you have a question to tee it up, we can start with that while they think. George, how, how important would you say is certification for leadership and career development for chaplains? Yeah, I, I that's a good question. Um, thank you. And I, I being having I'm now running my second certification process, which which uh, most people would say is makes you definitely certifiable uh, in not in a good way because uh, it's the being president was much easier after I was. Um, than being chair of certification. I think it's essential. I think every other discipline has certification. Uh, in the US, uh, we're now just edging into the point where, uh, because we are not licensed, and, and this is, I know this is a different fight in, in Canada uh, and a contentious one, but since we are not licensed and we're not going to be licensed because the faith groups in the US will not allow it, um, we've had trouble, um, we've been unable to establish our own credibility next to social work, nursing, medicine, everybody else in the world. We're just starting now to get some cracks in the armor. The Veterans Administration, uh, Health Administration in the U.S., which is the biggest healthcare system in the U.S., uh, has just really now pretty much said board certification, we consider that we will accept that as the surrogate for licensure for chaplains. Um, so first of all, for a job now to work in the VA, um, you have to be certified um, by uh, um, one of a list of certifying bodies. Um, and it's, it's all about, it's also a credibility issue. It establishes that you actually have some, you know something, uh, they think at least. So yeah, I, I think um, a lot of the standards in the US, uh, you know, say certification preferred, 
the only reason that's there is because there are not that many certified chaplains around and they don't want to limit their workforce. Um, and frankly, some of our certification processes are um, not very, not very um, efficient and uh, waste a lot of chaplain's time. So we, we have to fix that, but I, I'm, it's, you need to be certified. Um, people say, can I get a job without being certified? The answer is yes. Can you get a good job? No, not in the US. And I suspect increasingly in Canada as well. Thank you. It's one of the things that I uh, highlight and uh, promote as strongly as I can. I advocate, uh, encourage my colleagues to work towards certification. Well, and, and the other part of it now is that the, 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 the barrier had been that um, I can't, you know, I'm working, I can't go to a CP center, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't travel to, well, now you can get all of that online. You can, virtual CP is ubiquitous. I think it's being done by CASP now. Um, I know some people at the University of Toronto are doing some uh, of their courses that way. Um, and, and certification can be done, certainly in the US can be done all virtual. So that the whole thing about, I, I can't go, I can't go on, is gone, it's not happening anymore. Yeah. You know, certification early on gave me a pathway to, you know, it gave me a goal to work towards, which I appreciated very much. And I, um, I don't think I ever thought I wouldn't be certified. I, I just appreciated the professional yeah. opportunity and it was a, uh, an accomplishment I was proud of. I kind of wonder at this point, post-certification, how, how could I continue to develop, learn and grow in my profession? What advice would you have for chaplains, let's say, yeah. in the doldrums of mid-career <laughs> doldrums i i think you know if, if you've got a if you've got a passion um so for instance i mean the easiest one is palliative care and you know there are several uh, again online um courses that you can take in palliative care spiritual care and palliative care uh there are um um podcasts and webinars that are free um one of my and you know they're not necessarily spiritual care but you learn about um some of the other issues that are there and um one of my favorites is is called jerry pal it comes out of the university of california san francisco and beside the fact that they're the two guys that do it are really fun and they're fun to to listen to the stuff that they have um is uh um, they had one on, on neuropalliative care and, and some of the issues that are happening with people with um, ALS and uh, Alzheimer's uh, and some of those things that are really increasing in all our health systems. And you learn something about those and you go, huh, well, there's a place that, you know, uh, spiritual care could, you know, and occasionally I'll write to one of the presenters they have who's written an article and say, hey, you know, I read this article, but you didn't have spiritual care in it. And, oh, yeah, you know, we didn't quite know what to do with that. And, yeah, OK, so again, so here's a place where chaplains could kind of insert themselves and people are not, you know, they're friendly about it. They just didn't know what to say about spiritual care and dementia. They're physicians. Um, and maybe they don't have a chaplain at their place, or I don't know why. Uh, I think learning about research is big. I think every chaplain now, we didn't learn it in, in CPE, but you should learn how to read research. You should be what George Fichette calls research literate. Um, doesn't mean you have to be able to do it. We don't need everybody to do it. Not every doctor does research. Most of them don't. Uh, but they can read it, and they learn. They, they learned that and there's a huge amount now of spiritual care research being done, um, both in the US, um, I mean, Shane Sinclair in Calgary, um, chaplain researcher at the Calgary, uh, University of Calgary uh, Nursing School is one of the premier uh, spiritual care researchers in the world, um, internationally now. Um, so, Lots of good work. His his work, if you you know, if you haven't read his article on compassion, came out a few years ago. It's a it's a classic for the field, and he now has an institute in compassionate care uh, at Calgary. Um, 
there's a lot of that being done and um, you need to know it. Um, you need to read it, you need to understand it. Uh, and um, because it, you know, and heaven forbid some, some uh, palliative care doc, this was published, Shane's study was published in palliative care journal says, hey, you know, I just read this article by this guy, Shane Sinclair. And you go, huh, it's not good, not good. So um, there's a lot of places that are they're learning and they're, you know, the Journal of, of Palliative Medicine or, or um, Pain and Symptom Management. If you, you know, you're somebody who's in palliative care has it or your hospital library has it or, or the podcasts often like Jerry Powell, um, you can do for free. So there's no excuse anymore not to continually educate yourself. And there's all sorts of good opportunities. Uh, and uh, it may encourage you to, to write something yourself, you know? Um, or say to your, if you're doing neuropalliative care, for instance, to say to your team, hey, could we write something on spiritual issues? I'd like to do something on spiritual issues. Would you work with me? I've, I've read, it's, it's I, I, ha I don't know how many articles and chapters I've read. It's well over 100. Uh, but of those number, I only say that because I suspect that the number that on which I'm the only author is maybe five. I just don't do it. I have other chaplains or other people who, who work with me and do it and, and teach me while, while we write. Um, so does that, that's a little longer answer, but I'd say research, palliative care is big. Uh, it's gonna be the model of the future. It's a model of the present. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. You know, a lot of our members ask uh, the question before us always in our association is what, what value does the association, what do I get from my association? <laughs> I pay my dues, but what yeah, value yeah, do yeah, I really yeah. get? My question right. would be, what advice would you have for members to use their association, the resources available, perhaps develop some new resources. How can members use the association to learn, develop, and grow in their career? Um, it's a good question, you know, and I don't know. Um, and it's going to vary with the association. You know, I mean, admittedly, um, you know, CASC is not a big organization. I mean, they only recently, as some of you probably know, hired a real executive director for the first time in their history uh, that they've gotten to that point. So uh, it's, it's not a resource rich organization. Uh, I think they're, you know, you can find out what the association's doing. Um, you may have to help do it. I think, I think what you shouldn't do is go to the association and say, what are you going to give me? I think what you need to do is go to the association and say, what do you, what do you need that I can help? Um, or, or would you be interested in um, a group on this? Would you be interested in, um, I don't know, whatever you're interested in and forming a, a, a specialty group in that area? Uh, I think I think networking is critical. That's I think something any association should be doing uh, and helping you to to um, to do um, collecting resources uh, and and offering. I mean, I haven't looked at the Casper's uh, website recently, and the last I looked, it was just to look at certification. Um, so I don't know what's there. Um, I know they've been doing a lot of work in the area of curriculum and standardized curriculum. Um, don't know what else. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I'm, what is CAST doing to represent you to the provincial and federal structures um, in terms of this transformation that I can't even really talk about because I'm not, I wouldn't, it's, it's a little, um, complex to me. To, every time I try to understand it, I really can't. Um, so I don't want to uh, pose as an expert on that, but um, do you know what's going on? Do you, is there a way that you can 
advocate with the, the provincial or federal government of Canada for how you would like chaplaincy to be incorporated into those structures. Uh, and and uh, lend your voice and is there a group doing that? I don't know, good question, but um, you know, my thing about CASC is that they had the, the best parties of any conference that I ever went to for chaplaincy groups. So you could, you guys know how to do that. Uh, it was great, mm -hmm. especially it was in the middle of the winter. I thought, really? Oh, this is wonderful. Um, okay. Any other questions? Self -care. Out there? Good, good self-care, you know, it's, it's yeah. a great thing to have. Right. They do self-care. Mm -hmm. I was just, um, um, George, I was, I was sort of noting early in your introduction that you, you mentioned uh, how in the U.S. Psycho, the idea of psycho-spiritual care seemed so foreign um, and um, almost like it was somehow something they, you would want to steer a, away from. And um, I, I was just recalling, you know, in the early days of, of the, the conversations around joining a college and it, in Canada, our options were limited because we couldn't really afford as, as chaplains, as spiritual care practitioners to set up our own college. So we ended up joining the, um, the, the Ontario College, in Ontario, I should say, it's not Canada wide, but the, the Ontario College of Registered Psychotherapists. And there was this great worry that we would be kind of swallow, swallowed up by, by the mm -hmm. profession. Um, by, uh, and of course, there are many different disciplines involved in that college, but they all tend towards, you know, kind of a more secular um, kind of understanding of the human person. Right. And, and I just, I wondered, I was just curious about that comment because I, I wondered, is that what's, is, is that the thinking in the U.S.? generally i mean it's a very yeah yeah well now we we would use the term psychosocial psycho spiritual psychosocial spiritual that part is fine but that would um i th i think two things um one is <clears throat> on the one side of the ledger we need to protect we so, and, I'm, and I'm talking from the U.S. context now. So, you know, take that for what it is. Um, we need to stake out what territory we have that's unique. Um, if we don't have a unique territory, then we have no reason to be existing. That there shouldn't be. It can be done by another discipline, social work or psychiatry or psychology, probably, or even nursing. So we need to be careful along that. Um, and if you read the, the National Consensus Project uh, in the US, which is kind of our Bible for hospice and palliative care, but generally um, it stakes out that territory um, most clearly in the section on assessment and says that spiritual assessment is the province of the trained professional chaplain. So that is the place we have staked uh, as our place and we're trained and you're not. Um, so, and we're, we're call ourselves emotional care generalists, which means we do the psychological, but we're not the professionals. Uh, so, you know, as I said, I start, I started Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, which had Jimmy Holland, my, my friend, Jimmy Holland, psychiatrist ran a robust department uh, in psycho-oncology. So there are psychiatrists running all over Memorial. There was a social worker with an office on every patient unit when I arrived. And more than a, more than a few of those people were leery of what I thought I was going to do and what I thought I was going to add. And um, I learned very quickly that uh, I needed to know what that was. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, we would, we would, we would not use that. We would say we do emotional care. Um, it, it it gets tricky when you say um, we're we do mental health care or psychotherapy. Um, I have this. Some of you probably know Harvey Chachanoff, my my good friend Harvey Chachanoff, who trained at Memorial, but is now gone back to his native Winnipeg long ago. And uh, he's an inventor of something called dignity therapy. And I've always been, I, I wish he had not, and I've told Harvey this repeatedly, wish he had not used the term therapy. Um, it's, it's in the US still a term that we as chaplains would generally shy away from. And we would leave to the mental health professionals. I don't know if that's good or bad, and you know, I'm I'm just telling you it's it's developed in a different place. And I think partly out of the need to say we need to have, if we lose our unique place, we lose our whole raison d'etre. And they can wipe just wipe us out. Um, and we have a unique place. We do. So we need to protect that, and then however else you have to do it. If that means integrating in the College of Psychotherapy, fine. I don't have a problem with that. Is that helpful at all? Well, no, and I, I think it was integrating into the college that was that was the source yeah. of concern. And uh, yes, and, I understand. Yeah, but we are still. I mean, it's interesting because it might vary from from organizations uh, to, but. Um, but I know that on a couple of occasions, I have kind of strayed into the, the, the realm of psychology and I've been quickly pulled back. You know how sometimes there are, you know, in, in common usage, you will say someone, someone seemed depressed or, or right. you, 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 it's almost, you know, like to, re, to refer to a personality as a type A, it's kind of almost part of our, just our vernacular, but you get quickly um, yes. it, it gets it gets it redressed very quickly because it's those are considered DSM kind of diagnostic right. titles yeah. that you, you don't yeah. technically aren't qualified. So they, that's that has been pointed out, you know. And uh, so, uh, yep. so we're not really they, they're very protective of their realm too. Yeah, it's well, and we need to be protective of ours. Yes. I mean, we need to be integrated. I mean, there's a fine line. We need to be integrated. We need to be. Yes, we're all on the same team and we're not gonna operate in silos and there, there has to be overlap. And obviously we do emotional care and they do some, you know, nurses do some spiritual care. We call it spiritual care generalist care. Uh, but um, we've, we've not been good at, at, part of it is we've not been good at lining out what is the, what is the talent and the thing that we as chaplains bring to the table. And you're getting the other side, which is the psychologist saying, no, 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 you just strayed over to our lane, out. <laughs> and I, I think, yeah, and, and I think that we're, we're the ones who then are addressing things like, 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 uh, like shame and grief and loss. And sure. They don't use that yeah. kind of terminology. And, you know, Correct. Yeah. And so we claim those, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we should, and we should then know how to do it. That's the other thing. Um, we should know how we're going to, how we're going to do that. And, um, yeah, I think, I think if you look at NCP, if you look at, we had the same discussion I mentioned, I sit on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, um, Distress Management Guidelines Panel, which is a, a unified assessment system for mental health, you know, non-medical distress in cancer, but then it's out of this distress, what are the categories and what goes to the chaplain, what goes to the social worker, what goes to the psychiatrist? So we had long discussion um, of what the terminology was for each. Um, and the only one that wound up in more than one place was grief, you mentioned, because the etiology can be either spiritual or emotional social. So we said, okay, that we have to, and then how do we work back and forth with those team members on stuff? You know, they get a referral and they discover that there's a spiritual issue. How do they discover that? How do they refer it? 
all of that is important to, to have clear um, in our own heads, first of all. And, and also that we all, the big problem we have in the US, you may or may not have in Canada, although I suspect you do, um, you talk to five different chaplains, you get five different answers to that question. That can't be. Um, because, oh, well, I talked to Ann. Well, I talked to Robert and he said something totally different. Or maybe he didn't, but it sounded like it was different. So all of that is part of the leading, welcome to my world of why you know I make enemies because no, you can't use the word anymore. Um, uh, and uh, I have a good, the good, the guy who's head of psycho-oncology now at Memorial, Bill Breitbart, is a great friend and I've known him for decades. He wants to claim existential. He'll let me have religious and spiritual as long as I let him have existential. Um, and then we have great debates about what the line is, you know, because <laughs> he's a raving existentialist. Um, of the Irvi Alam School. Okay, well, that's great. Well, thank but, you. Thank you for your comment. It, it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard, but we have to keep as a profession and this is place to lead and to say, okay, we need, a, we need standardized language folks. Mm, yeah, um, I agree. And this like you can do your own thing and say it every way you want, you know, it's not mm -hmm. gonna work. You're gonna be out on the street. So. Thank you so much, George. It's so good to uh, reconnect with you and to uh, yeah. listen to you. Uh, there's a couple minutes left. If there's any final questions. Any, anybody have a last last burning <clears throat> question that they that I've been monopolizing the time and you haven't asked? George, I don't know if you can answer it in the time we have, but one of the things that I experience is that um, as professionals in the hospital and previously when I worked in long-term care, um, as interdisciplinary professionals get to know what it is that I do and they see um, the effect that my work has, they get to understand it and they buy in and they like it. But my, my struggle is how to, how to have a larger institution recognize that. It's, yeah. it's great that a right. nurse does and this physician does and right. the psychiatrist sees that I do good work with grief support. But how do, how do you get it outside of sort of this, uh, I don't know, limited yep. understanding of what it is that we do to a point where the whole hospital can say, you know what, we do need to put more funding into this. We do need to recognize. Right. It. Yeah, well, I, I'd say two things quick. Um, one is um, do your best to say, if the nurse comes to you with a compliment, uh, say, gee, that's really great. But if you could tell your supervisor and pass that up the chain of command so the director of nursing knows about it and maybe the, you know, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, I say the same thing to patients. Great, thank you. I really appreciate your comment. If you would write a letter to the administrator here, I'll give you his name. Uh, that would be really helpful. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a piece of it. The other piece is are there places, you know, like me, I got offered this chance to present at a national conference. Is there a place where you can get on programs like that? Can you write a, a, a blog for the long-term care newsletter? Can you, um, can you, um, um, you know, is there something that you can do for the staff um, that would come to the attention of the administration? Um, I, the other thing I, I, when I interview administrators, I say, what keeps you up at night? I don't even ask them what they want to do about chaplains because they don't know, or they give me some dumb answer. Um, but I say, what keeps you up at night? And, you know, I, I mean, one answer, just, just as an example, I know we're over time, but um, uh, this administrator, CEO, uh, said to me, you know, every once in a while, we, like all hospitals, we have a death in the OR. And when that happens, the whole OR team leaves and they leave some surgical resident to sew up this dead body on their own. And wouldn't it be nice if somebody could be in there keeping them company? And I said, ma'am, consider it done. Uh, here's this, you know, we'll have a system. And I was, I was just a consultant. I went back to the director of the department and said, here's what you're gonna do. Um, and 
because it's about keeping the CEO happy. So that's the other thing, you know, what do they want you to do? What's the new service that they really want patients catered for? What, you know, uh, this other, the same CEO told me, you know, the other day there was a fight over a parking space in, you know, outside the hospital and employees. This is a suburban hospital. There's plenty of parking. She knew damn well it wasn't about the parking. She said, something's going on in my staff and I don't like it. Good. I sent one of my chaplains. I said, I want you to go down to the men's locker room. Hang out. Find out what the hell's going on down there. And we're going to take care of it. Um, that, that you can do. Thank you, George. Well, George, you've given us a great uh, call to action by uh, highlighting the need for leaders in spiritual care. And I appreciate yeah, that. We have that. Yeah. Okay. And, Thank and, you very uh, much for your you time. Know, I'm, I'm easy to find. If anybody has another question or comment or wants to do something, um, email me. I'm good. Don't try to call me. That's bad. You'll never find me. I, I, I'm terrible. But I, I'm real good about answering emails. So uh, feel free. You, you know that, right? <laughs> Take care, folks. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.